Religious studies generally finds a home in the humanities and the social sciences. So that means historians, anthropologists, sociologists, archaeologists. But there is a whole subset of religious studies experts that use the tools of science and technology to generate data about religion. On the cutting edge of this research is the Institute for the Biocultural Study of Religion, which uses computer simulation to model the social dynamics of religion. And you're probably familiar with computer simulation being used for research, but you just don't realize it yet. Studies on galaxy collisions are done through computer modeling since we can't observe these processes over the course of vast stretches of time. Computer models are also used to measure carbon dioxide levels in our atmosphere. You can't even set up a new ride at Disney World without first running it through a computer simulation. So how can we use computer simulation to study religion? Today I sit down with Dr. Connor Wood who works with the Modeling Religion Project to find out. So could you just introduce yourself? What do you research? What do you do? So I'm a postdoc with the Institute for the Biocultural Study of Religion, uh, which is a private, independent research institute based here in Boston for the purpose of doing cultural and biological, cognitive, and evolutionary research into religious behavior and phenomena. So when people hear the phrase, the scientific study of religion, they often think of using the tools of science to try to prove the existence of God or to to confirm the ideological bias of the researcher, but this is definitely not what you and your institute does. Could you explain what the scientific study of religion is or looks like? So the scientific study of religion, you're right, is not an investigation into theological questions like the existence of God, what's the purpose of life, whether there's an afterlife, those kinds of things. That's not on the agenda. What we do is study those aspects of religion that can be looked at from the outside and quantified in a scientific paradigm. There's a large stream in the scientific study of religion that looks at demographics, just straight demographics. So that's numbers. Those are objective measures of, say, the growth of Mormonism and the decline of Episcopalianism of the Episcopal Church in the United States. The growth of Sunni Islam and uh, the decline of old Protestant Christianity in Europe, that kind of thing. So the Institute's currently running a project called the Modeling Religion Project. Could you just give a few examples of the type of research that this project is doing? The Modeling Religion Project is a three year long project, research project, that's using computer simulation techniques to study theories of religion. One example of the, the questions that we're studying using computer simulation is the role that religion has played in the transformation of culture, cultural forms throughout time. Religion plays a key role in each one of those transitions and we can model them using both agent-based models and system dynamic models. So agent-based models use simulated individual people who populate a abstract landscape and interact with each other and with the environment according to the algorithms that you program in. So you could have a very simple agent-based model in which, for example, each agent is programmed only to look for the nearest resources, to move to the nearest resources, consume them, and um, try and maximize its resource consumption. So the idea of, of behind an agent-based model is that you're trying to grow, they say grow, um, larger scale phenomena from very very basic initial rules and conditions. You just program in a few conditions, you set your agents loose, and then you watch as they all of a sudden develop tribes or groups or conflicts or social hierarchies. Um, and so we hope to be able to model some of the dynamics that you find in the transitions between different types of, of societies using agent-based frameworks. Um, the programming and behavior that is drawn from archaeological, um, sociological, anthropological, cognitive scientific, and evolutionary literatures. So much of religion is subjective. Our thoughts, our fears, our anxieties. So how do you translate the subjective experience of religion into computer models? The first answer to that is that we don't. I mean, there's a lot about religion that is not accessible to scientific inquiry in the sense that it's not, um, you know, you can't really build a model of how it feels to take Eucharist, take the Eucharist as a Christian or to partake in a Passover Seder 
as a Jewish um, person. Those personal aspects of religious behavior and um, traditions are personal. They're, they're, they're internal to people. Um, and it's actually important that we sort of understand that we're not trying to capture every single aspect of religion in that way. Um, because what we're trying to do is really deal with those aspects of religion that can be quantified and plugged into an equation. So, for example, right now I'm working on a model that looks at shamanism. Shamanism is a broad, you know, it's a broad concept, but it's something that is found all over the world. People who are sort of individual um, healers, spiritual mediums, they might be possessed by spirits themselves during ceremonies, or they might leave their bodies and go to a spirit world, or so, you know, according to the culture, um, and are used for healing and for sort of psychological reasons. You know, things are going bad, so you go to the shaman and hopefully he can help you. So the thing is, though, that in complex cultures with a segmented hierarchy like ours, you know, where we've got rich people and poor people and leaders and farmers and everybody, right, you're much more likely to get women being shamans and to have um, spirit possession, where the spirits actually come into the bodies of the shaman during an ecstatic ceremony where maybe, there, maybe there's a lot of drumming and dancing, the spirits come into the shaman's body and then she uh, uses the power of those spirits to heal or help the people who are attending the ritual. In less stratified societies like hunter-gatherer or nomadic cultures where there's no formal level of leadership or hierarchy, you often find um, males being shamans and they don't get possessed. As the, the, instead of getting possessed during a ceremony, they you know, supposedly depart their bodies and, and travel in the spirit world. So the model I'm working on now is trying to replicate this so that in cultures where there are, uh, where there's a lot of stratification, we find female shamans who um, take part in ecstatic spirit possession cults or, or, or religions. Whereas in more egalitarian cultures, we would find male shamans who don't get possessed. The reason that that has to do with the subjective aspect of things is because there's a lot of research showing that social hierarchy is, is a real um, stressor for humans. Where you, where you are on the social ladder has a lot of effect on how you feel about life, what your health outcomes are like, how much stress you feel in your daily life. People who are on the lower ends of the social ladder have a ton of physiological stress and that, you know, they experience a lot of stress. There's something really interesting tragic but also interesting about the fact that you get this sort of um, ecstatic expression of emotion and encounter with spiritual beings that's mediated through physiological and cognitive frameworks and social frameworks in societies where there are a lot of people suffering at the bottom of the hierarchy. But you get a different type of encounter, a healing encounter with spirits you know, spirits in a different type of society. People are actually out there in the real world experiencing those things. So we can't replicate those feelings, but we can get real insight into what sorts of effects social hierarchy has on real people. And if the model, if we find out that our model can actually replicate the results that we've, you know, that the, the literature shows us, they'll replicate the data that we actually have, then we'll get a uh, we'll have a good idea that we've learned something real about how social dynamics affect real people in the world. So that is the first half of my interview with Dr. Woods. Stay tuned for the next episode where we'll finish it up. I'm including links to Dr. Woods' blog, Science on Religion, which is great if you're interested in the scientific study of religion. I'm also including links to his Huffington Post blog. Also a special shout out to Jen Lindsay who helped me film this interview. She is both a scholar of religion and a filmmaker who is working for the Modeling Religion Project to make a documentary about it. Also a special shout out to my Patreon supporters. Because of you guys, I'm able to make more ambitious videos like this interview. If you're interested in supporting the Patreon campaign, check out the links in the description as well. And as always, thanks for watching and subscribing, and I'll see you next time.